to a numbers game with your host, Gil Alexander. Broadcasting live from our VSIN studios in Las Vegas. Back on a numbers game right here at VSIN, the Vegas Stats and Information Network, Sirius XM Channel 204. It's Gil Alexander. I love when people say, uh, this next guest needs no introduction, and then they proceed to introduce him. I will do the same. This next guest really does need no introduction, but just for the sake of introduction, uh, he won 32 consecutive games on Jeopardy uh, that were aired between April 4th and June 2nd. He raked in more than $2.4 million. I'll be exact. $2,462,216 worth of prize money. That is an average of uh, when you factor in game 33, which was the game he lost, when you put it all in the mix, he averaged $74,673 per episode. That average beats the previous single game high before he ever showed up, ladies and gentlemen. Jeopardy, James. James Holtower, good morning to you, sir. How you doing? Hi. I hate to correct you. The previous game record was 77,000, and there actually is a vocal community of fans online who were disappointed that I didn't uh, get a little bit more to beat that average throughout the, the whole run. But wow. Well, just a little short of it. So, so yes, so, so my, my intel here is incorrect then, so you just fell short of that. Pretty close, though. Um, first of all, Jeopardy James, do you like that name, or do you sort of... Does that no, make you feel I, uncomfortable? I made it the, uh, the URL from my original fan page on Facebook, so I can't be too upset with that. I mean, people like alliteration. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I, I don't, it's not like I feel that people are trying to define my entire life by this. They're just, you know, it's kind of the, the celebrity persona I got. So, so no first of all, thank you for coming. I, uh, we're going to get into your sports betting because you are a sports better, and I want to talk to you about that uh, during this hour. But, and I know you've, you've talked about the Jeopardy aspect of this and the background many, many times in other media, but for those who are tuning in for the first time who have not, how did, when did the Jeopardy bug start for you? How did you ever get it in your mind, hey, I want to go on this show? Uh, well, it's kind of been a long time coming. I would say when I was eight, I like to say that my life path was set out early in life because I happened to grow up in the Chicago area and uh, I would have kind of access to the TV before my dad got home from work. And in the Chicago area, unlike most places, we had day baseball because the Cubs played afternoon games all but uh, like 18 games a year when I was living there. And then we had Jeopardy. And so Jeopardy was on at 3.30 p.m. there where it normally airs. Uh, you know, just before prime time in most markets. So I would be watching baseball on Jeopardy when, at an age where I think most kids wouldn't be allowed to catch these things on at night. And I got the idea like, hey, I'm really into baseball stats. I'm really into this game show. You know, maybe one day I can parlay these into a career. You know, <laughs> just kind of happened that way. Um, I would say when I was a young adult, I would take the Jeopardy test online and kind of just be glad to get on the show. But then down the road, I thought, well, wait a minute, you know, this is my one opportunity at this. Why not really try to do my best, you know, do things no one's ever seen before? I really think that the, the potential for human achievement is sometimes so much higher than anyone realizes until you try it. Yeah, I, I sort of comically say on this show, when I bet unders in games, I'm betting against human achievement. That's sort of a, <laughs> a thing I gravitate towards. Uh, so it's interesting that you use that phrase. So just to clarify then, so you were intrigued by Jeopardy, Jeopardy as a child. You were on a couple game shows internationally before Jeopardy, correct? Yeah, uh, so Jeopardy was always the dream, I would say. Um, but around 2011, I took a hiatus from sports betting for a few years and, you know, I needed a project then. So I've seen somewhere in the media, people say I intentionally took off work to prepare for Jeopardy, which is not really true. But at the same time, I was, you know, kind of on sabbatical and needed something to do. And I thought I could get really, really good at trivia and, you know, really knock the show dead when I get on there. And while I was waiting for Jeopardy to put me through the ringer and get me on. There were a couple other shows, The Chase and 500 Questions that I did get on. So how many times did you audition or go through the the application process, okay. if you will, so the, for Jeopardy before they called you back? They have an online test, and I've taken that every year since 2006. Um, this is only my second in-person audition. So if you pass the test, I think they have a random draw for who gets to go to the in-person audition, and then maybe like 10 to 20% of the people who go to the in-person audition get to go on the show. Okay, so there's two elements of this. Obviously, there's then, okay, oh, they call you back and you're like, hey, we, you, we want you to be on Jeopardy. You, there's got to be a knowledge base that you've got to acquire. What did you lean on? Now you have, how much time was between that phone call and your first appearance on Jeopardy? How much time are we talking about there? So oh. there were three weeks, and uh, my first episode taped on February 5th, which is two days after the Super Bowl. So it was kind of tricky for me to determine how, to, how I was going to, 
uh, divide my time between prepping for the show and betting Super Bowl props. And, you know, it, it turned out to be a great Super Bowl for me because, as you know, the pros often bet on a boring game happening and like, oh, my God, you can't get a more boring Super Bowl than we just had. So, you know, I, I, it was great because I kind of walked into the studio with like, well, you know, this is a great week for me financially, even if I punt this <laughs> right now. Um, yeah, you know, three, the three weeks they give you is not enough time really to prepare for the show. You kind of have to be doing your prep work in advance even before that. And, you know, they, they require a really broad knowledge base, but not a particularly deep one. So I would say my, one of my key strategies was to go to, like, the children's section of the library, look for a book that's aimed at 12-year-olds, that uh, they know, hey, this reader doesn't have a great attention span. They're not really that interested in the subject, but let's get them interested, you know, and that, that really worked well for me. So, so children's books, because they cover a wide variety of subjects in a succinct manner, that was sort of your hack on that. Uh, you also, I, I, you know, there's a lot of literature, for instance, that, that is asked about on Jeopardy. You're not reading entire books. What was your sort of shortcut for that? Uh, well, you know, there, there's a lot of material out there for everything. You know, they have these people who, draw. I would say they draw up like an animated summary of a Shakespeare play that boils down into a seven minute video you can watch on YouTube. You know, if you're able to process that and you, you don't want to actually read the Shakespeare play like me, you know, then most of the nuts and bolts of what Hamlet is about are on there if you really want to get it that way. And for the most part, I mean, if it's not like the Bible or Romeo and Juliet, they don't expect you to have actually read the book and taken notes on it or something like that. You know, you're supposed to know the major themes, the character names, that kind of stuff, the author, obviously. So, talking to James Holtzauer, by the way, <clears throat> who uh, just fell shy of Ken Jennings' uh, all-time money haul in the history of Jeopardy, uh, but set so many records within the, uh, within the context of the show by himself, and by many is regarded as the greatest Jeopardy player who has ever played because of that. Missed a grand total of four daily doubles <laughs> the entire run and one final Jeopardy the entire run. So there's the knowledge base that we just talked about. That's one thing that's obviously sort of baseline level that every Jeopardy contestant would study on their own. You had your own way of doing it. Others would have their other way. But your real differentiator um, was the fact that you came up with a Jeopardy strategy that now in retrospect, having seen you play it this way, seems so obvious to every viewer. But what was it that you determined? Now, I, I, I assume that when you were eight years old, first, <laughs> first dreaming about Jeopardy, that's not what had happened for you. When did you come up with your special, I'm going to, instead of going 100 to 200 to 300, I'm going to start with big money, and then I'm going to use my sports betting acumen when betting in daily doubles? Yeah, so, you know, the way I approach sports betting is similar to the way I approach Jeopardy. You know, you don't look at what everyone else is doing and then just try to copy it and add a few sprinkles here or there. What you can do is just kind of look at the rules of the game and think, like, how can I best approach this? You know, how would a, a computer you program to play this game optimally approach this thing? And, you know, it turns out that that's often a lot different than what everyone else around you is doing, you know, and sometimes it takes someone else doing it for you to recognize that, hey, this is a valid approach that can work for you. I think, uh, you know, of poker, I've, I haven't really tried to play poker competitively for a number of years, but if you look back 15 years ago when I was playing the strategy people were doing, compared to now, you know, it's completely different because it took some people saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, we, we need to start occasionally five betting pre-flop as a bluff, you know, it might not have occurred to anyone to do it, but, you know, some, someone who was really trying to optimize their strategy would have thought of this. Uh, you know, someone who's trying to optimize their Jeopardy strategy would think, well, wait a minute, what does it do, good does it do me to hit a daily double if I have $1,000 in front of me? Well, if you have 6000 now you can really make a big dent with that. Well, you would accumulate, so you would start, in other words, you were, you were accumulating as much money as possible. You were oftentimes starting at the bottom uh, of the grid on Jeopardy, whereas for years and years, folks would just go in sort of a systematic order down. And then when you would get to the daily doubles, it was sort of a, uh, you know, serve two purposes. One, you would bet to have a huge, uh, big lead um, beyond what was normal in the past. And it also served to eliminate those daily doubles, which are the high variance moments that could have allowed other people back into the game. So it's sort of this perfect strategy. If I'm playing you in Jeopardy, there's really no, wouldn't I employ the same strategy? Like that would be how you would advise me to play you? Uh, yes. And, you know, I will say most of my opponents when they were up there, you know, even if they'd only see me for a game, they knew, okay, you know, this guy is different. I need to change up the game plan I had coming in here. And I guess 
one of the downsides of this is I'm, you're kind of teaching the opponents to play better against you. Sure. And this almost cost me um, one of my, I want to say my 26th game, there was a, a player who built up a huge lead against me and he uh, could have moved all in on a daily double but didn't. And I think he still bet like half his stack when he already had a big lead, which I think is more than he would have done otherwise. But, you know, I was kind of training my opponents to play this hyper-aggressive approach that's, you know, worked better, a lot better against me than what they were planning to do going in, probably. Uh, I, in, in preceding this interview, I went on some of these Jeopardy sort of sites that people are super, super involved with Jeopardy. And there is some history. There was one guy back in the day for like a five-game run. He employed this strategy. Were you aware of him? That was like the one historical example of someone who had employed the strategy that you did. Uh, I mean, I'm aware of all the things that have come before me. I would I would say I developed the strategy myself, but I, I don't... Uh, I mean, there are certainly elements that are similar to people who have come before me, absolutely. Well, so... Yes, everyone can now take your strategy and do it. Emily uh, Butcher, I believe is her uh, name. Yeah. She beat you on the 33rd, which aired on, on June 3rd. She only lasted three games herself. So clearly, uh, it's not that easy to do, right? You have to be able to do everything. And your key, Alan Boston, who I'm not sure if you're familiar with, Alan Boston, famous college basketball better, who is a friend of this show and has been on many times, avid Jeopardy watcher, watches it every night. And he's like, look, he said, James's skill set, James's number one skill is his ability to anticipate the buzzer. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes. I mean, you know, if I had to play two people from the street at Jeopardy, my knowledge base would rule over everything. But the people who are on the show, you know, they pass a difficult test to be there. They all know most of the clues up there. Maybe not as many as I do necessarily, but most of the board, you know, if they're, if you, uh, are buzzing in only 33% of the time, then, you know, that's really going to make it tough to win, and you got to rely on all kinds of other stuff. But I was winning the buzzer race, I think, I don't know, 50 to 60%, something like that, and that really just gives you a huge leg up over the competition. Um, I noticed uh, in the pregame warm-ups that Emma seemed to have a really great buzzer control, and I was kind of worried about uh, when I was going to have to face her. And I think I, I won the buzzer a few <laughs> more times than she did in our game, but she was clearly like top notch at it really great buzzer control but so now let me just ask one follow up to that everyone can see the question so what i'm assuming you're doing you're reading it fast so alex trebek is very deliberate how he reads it right he's very clear very concise how he reads it and it's sort of a slow uh tenor to what he's doing so i assume you're reading it quicker but your opponents can do the same thing what would you say, distill it to one point, why are you so much better at the buzzer? Like, what is it? You just have a quicker reaction time? What is it? You, sp you speed read better? Uh, I don't know about that. One thing I definitely worked on is uh, trying to solve the clue in less time than it took to, to read it. So, you know, you can kind of, I, I, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'm under the impression that people can create like new neural pathways where if you say study the order of the presidents enough, then if someone calls out 18th president, it's just like answering two plus two. You know, you don't have to think about it. You just uh, know that it's uh, Ulysses S. Grant. I had to think about that for a second there, <laughs> actually. Right. But um, you, and once you kind of get to that level, you, okay, now you have the entire clue to focus on either Alex's voice or when the board lights are coming on. If you have 100% of your attention on that instead, then it really helps your ability to react to that moment. Um, I had a, a practice buzzer that I kind of built out of a mechanical pencil at home. And oh, there my was, God. Yeah, you built a practice buzzer out of a mechanical pencil. I did. And, you know, this is actually a very common thing that people uh, on the show do. Most of them <laughs> wow. just don't, don't get the opportunity to talk about it. But uh, they'll take a pen or a, a popular choice is actually the, the tube that your toilet paper sits on. You can uh, press the, <laughs> the, the retractor thing on that. Oh, that's right. The the buzzer, little, yeah. That's right. Um, so... You, you bring up Ulysses S. Grant, so this kind of jogs in my in my thinking. In your, is there Jeopardy data? Like I, I grew up in D.C. People cheated on drivers' tests from year to year when they got to 16 years of age because they they passed the same tests from the year forward. So they knew the questions. They knew actually the order of the multiple choice. Is there a history? Is there a database of Jeopardy questions where let's take Ulysses S. Grant, where Ulysses S. Grant questions weren't asked as much on Jeopardy as say uh, I don't know Chester A. Arthur questions. Uh, yes, they they have a, a it's kind of a fan created archive. I assume that the the show has its own archive that is not publicly accessible, but there is one that is free to the public uh, called the Jeopardy Archive, and 
they have like fans transcribing all the shows basically and they got a search function where you can kind of now it's tricky you know because if you search for Ulysses Grant not everyone says the first name on the show so you might have to search for just Grant and then you get like if someone wrote a grant for a million dollars that'll pop up too but for the most part you can kind of run searches and see how often these names come up and you'll determine okay it's five times as important to know George Washington as Chester Arthur and you kind of know where to focus your attention there. So you're aware of all of that going into it. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, there might be other sites I'm not aware of, but this right. this one is. But I you mean, had you had some sense that you needed to study that sort of thing, like you figure out what they ask more than uh, than others. Yes, you kind of get yeah. the idea. Like you know, I <laughs> I watch pro wrestling and I uh, listen to a lot of death metal stuff, and that I know is never going to come up on the show, and it's <laughs> it's too bad. But uh, you know, you you recognize which subjects they are going to ask about and which ones they aren't. Uh, you were just telling me off air. You just were on vacation. You were in Prague, you were in Lisbon, you were uh, in Barcelona as well, and you were recognized there as well pretty often? Yeah, I would say it happened virtually every day, uh, you know, especially when I was at the airport or something, and you, you get only tourists at the airport, and a lot of Americans are, I assume, are there Americans uh, out there and asking me, oh, are you Jeopardy James? You know, they s- Do you embrace that? Do you love that? Like, is this a good development in your life, or is it getting to a point now where you're sort of like, uh, I don't know if I like this so much, or you is know, it all good? Well, I would say, like, uh, <laughs> there were were definitely times where my my daughter was acting out in public, and I would have preferred at that exact moment to, uh, to <laughs> have an anonymous face. But for the most part, it's nice to see fans out there. You alluded to the fact that there was a gentleman who almost beat you during your 32 game streak, uh, and obviously uh, Emily Butcher eventually did on uh, Emma Butcher rather on on your 33rd. Were there other times throughout this run? Now that you look back on it and sort of do the inventory, how many times do you think? You got, with all the things we've just talked about, your knowledge base, your buzzer ability, uh, your instincts for um, the Jeopardy database of questions, the fact that you employed the perfect Jeopardy strategy, all of that in the mix, just like in poker. You can still have everything set up perfectly, but then there's a certain element of luck involved. How many times did you, did the 32-game streak stay alive in your assessment based on just sheer luck? Oh, it's... Uh, well, I, I mean, I don't know how... Sheer luck is defined, but certainly I needed some element of fortune at least 10 times over the streak. You know, I think there's one uh, time in my second game where I had, I basically moved all in on a daily double that I needed because I was behind in the score at that time. And they asked which uh, college was nicknamed Sadie Lou. And I knew this really only because my wife and I had talked about naming our daughter Sadie. And so she said, oh, it's a diminutive of Sarah. It's very nice. And I thought, okay, it's got to be something Sarah. Oh, Sarah Lawrence. Makes sense. You know, that... I, you know, I don't think that Sadie Lou is a well-known nickname, so that's like the only way I could have gotten there on this is because something like that happened. It's uh, kind of crazy to think about. Well, and I think that's, you know, in so many of the correlation, you know, we talked about eliminating the, uh, the high variance daily doubles, um, your, your risk, your aversion, the ability to treat the money um, you know, I think most people who come on a show like Jeopardy, they're constantly thinking, well, I'm betting $16,000. You, as a sports player, you just don't have that mentality. And I think that portion right there that we just talked about um, is obviously something that as a poker player, as you said, as a sports better, you're more conditioned for, right? You, ha- you embrace the fact that there's going to be this kind of variance, and you're okay with the fact that, oh, yeah, the- this is going to be part of this game. Sometimes the chips fall where they may, in other words. Yeah, you, you kind of uh, develop the mindset not only of, okay, I can lose this money, but also, you know, I can lose some money and still keep playing the game. You know, if I, if I quit work every day, every time I lost a bet, I'd never get anything done. You know, is it even, uh, I was, I mean, I don't even know if the the gambling background helped that much. I noticed like there were people I was playing against who came from all sorts of professions. You know, Emma is a librarian. I thought, okay, well, she hit this daily double against me when she had, I think, maybe two thirds of my score in our game. And I thought, okay, well, she's a librarian. Maybe she won't bet at all here. No, she did. She knew she that was the move she had to do. And uh, you know, kudos to her. She pulled it out. It had to help in most. But where do you think it helped the most? The sports betting background, though. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a part. I mean, in terms of just winning the game, I'm not sure how much the the giant daily double bets actually helped. But you know, in terms of like setting up these these huge paydays, you know, that required a, a level of guts that I think most non gamblers wouldn't have displayed in that moment. One more thing about this, and we'll get onto your sports betting here after the break. But the show aired. April, uh, you're, you're part of the show, from April 4th, I believe it was, to June 3rd. Um, you had obviously taped this. Was your entire taping before the run? Was it staggered in the middle? 
Yeah, it was the entire thing was before. I think my last tape date was something like March 12th, which uh, you know worked out well for me because it was right before March Madness. I can get back to work, although right. I, I did not win on March Madness. So. so, so when your shows were airing, you obviously knew how far you got. You knew the outcomes. When the hype was growing, and, and I don't use hype with any connotation to it, but when the publicity was growing, and your your Q factor, your star power was getting bigger and bigger. Because you knew that you just fell short of some of Ken's records, like obviously the, the, the game streak, he went a, a crazy amount, 74 games, was it? Yes. Um, and he was winning a lot at a, at a much uh, uh, lower clip than you were. But as that hype was developing, was there a little part of you that sort of wanted to downplay it publicly because you knew this outcome? I was always curious about that because I was trying to, when I was hearing you in interviews and watching you, I was looking for tells myself. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if he broke it because he seems, maybe you're just the most super humble guy in the world, but it almost seems in some cases that he was bashful. Was I reading into that at all correctly? Um, maybe. I mean, I would say, like, first of all, I was completely blown away by how much attention I was receiving. You know, some people tried to prepare me for this and I said like, okay, come on, it's Jeopardy. You know, there's not that many people out there who are that interested in this stuff. But uh, yeah, I was just in awe of the different media types that wanted to talk to me and uh, how many people it turns out are closet Jeopardy fans or either that or they're just really excited to see someone do something very differently than anything they've ever seen before. So I, I kind of, you know, was reacting to the level of attention being, I don't know, five times what I expected it to be. Um, I would say, like, it was, if I had to not break the record, it was kind of nice to come so close to doing it, you know, make it a, a really spectacular sweat down the line. And I, I didn't really want to downplay that because I thought it was kind of cool how uh, how close I got and came just short. It, it was awesome. It was amazing. Were you? Were I mean, what was your level? How bummed were you at that moment? Were you just super dejected, or were you okay with it? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a funny story. So when I right after the the taping finished and I kind of had to go sign my forms to collect my second place money. One of the producers came up to me and uh, she gave me a hug and she actually started crying because she was, she <laughs> oh, said she had wow. never seen the, anyone play the game so beautifully before. And I had to like kind of uh, pat her on the back and comfort her. <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing. This was ending. Wow. Uh, but you know, I mean, I, I would say like, it was kind of a bittersweet moment. Obviously I wasn't happy to lose, but at the same time, you know, I, uh, <laughs> it was getting a little stressful. Um, going back there every week uh, and you know I was kind of like I, I, had, I had put this achievement uh, checked it off the bucket list you know like it's okay to move on with life now yeah well absolutely and obviously no shame in that I love that you're comforting her and she's appreciating <laughs> just how well you played the game well uh, James Holtzauer for those tuning in biggest Jeopardy winner by season uh, among his records biggest one game winner at first he broke it he had, he had a $110,000 plus night then a $131,000 uh, event largest successful daily double wager of $25,000 largest successful final Jeopardy wager of $38,000 first then uh, I believe it was uh, $60,000 again after that 60,000 plus on one wager uh we will get into some of your sports betting stuff next how about that sure we'll do that james holtzauer right here on a numbers game at vison it's a numbers game live from the tip of the strip in las vegas get your fill of numbers even after the show is over by following the crew on twitter at beating the book and at vison live some of what you missed. I just have a hard time understanding how people think Michigan, who was supposed to have their best defense under Jim Harbaugh, loses so many key components, and all of a sudden you've got a pedestrian quarterback in Shea Patterson. There's a reason. Listen, when guys transfer, there's generally a pretty good reason. As good as Kyler Murray was in Norman, he was not the starting quarterback in College Station. And for whatever reason, it obviously turned out to be a better fit for him there. But the majority of the time when a player transfers, Ron, it's because they're not good enough to play there. That's just the bottom line. Nobody ever transfers because, hey, you know what? I'm balling out. I'm SEC Player of the Year. I'm going up to the Big 12 because I'm going to dominate even more. And this is sexy, no doubt about it. This was uh, sent to us from a viewer. The only game in town, it's like crack, Ultimate X, single play. Single play, Ultimate X. There's your big boy. That's a Royale with cheese seven times. 50 cents, seven times, 14 large. He held three, and it came queen, 10. Diamonds, beautiful, lock it up. Make good, it rain. It's a good feeling. It's a great one. Well, I mean, it's, you wouldn't know. 
I would. Yeah, I hit one like 11 years no, ago. It's only good. for a thousand. It's when you play this game on the single play. It's it's, it's a good feeling when you have like the multipliers out there like seven times, oh. ten times, and you're dealt three of a kind, or you are dealt a potential flush. Or a I don't straight. even. People understand. They might. I, I lose my. I'm screaming at the at the bar. And when I'm playing, because if you get that 12 times and don't get anything, or you get dealt the three of a kind 12 times, yeah. you're, you're yelling. You're begging for the call. You of call. Of course you are. Car. Yeah. Come on. And you got to take a breath. Times. Yep. I mean, 12 times in a four of a kind, huge. I like Michigan State over that number of seven and a half. Yeah, and there's a good shot. they start. And it's to... minus 105, too. It's yep. a pretty good price. Yeah, good shot that they could start the season 5-0 and because the start of the season, not too bad. Tulsa at home in August. Western Michigan, revenge spot against Arizona State, who now has to go to East Lansing uh, to start out the year. Those are all three straight at home on the road to Northwestern. I think Northwestern's going to be better with the talented quarterback now. But first, what, six games or so going into that Ohio State game on October 5th? You could look at Michigan State with just one loss heading into that road game with the Buckeyes. What was my by far my biggest bet here these last couple days? Tennis. Tennis. It's all I'm betting. Yeah. So while everybody's banging their heads against a wall betting these baseball games, which quite frankly, you can go any way in any, sure. you know, the way that baseball works sure. out this year, regardless of your predictive model, whatever. I'm betting tennis every morning, and it is just a pleasure. to a numbers game with your host, Gil Alexander, broadcasting live from our VSIN studios in Las Vegas. Back on a numbers game where sports betting analytics live actionable sports betting information. It's Gil Alexander. Um, update, open championship in Royal Portrush there in Ireland. Shane Lowry still with the two-stroke lead. Uh, Shane has played 13 holes, so five left to go. Two-stroke lead over J.B. Holmes. Uh, who's in the clubhouse, eight under par. Tommy Fleetwood, Lee Westwood, three shots currently back in the clubhouse as well uh, at seven under as uh, Eldrick Tiger Woods fails to make the cut. Just want to point that out as well this morning. And, um, of course, we'll follow it all weekend long right here on VEASAN. Back on the show here with James Holtzhauer, Jeopardy James, kind enough to join us. <clears throat> James, I said we were going to move on to your, uh, to your sports betting. One last thing, though. I mentioned uh, in the previous segment that in your entire run, you missed four daily doubles and one final Jeopardy question. I want to see how, how much this has stuck in your craw or how your brain works if you just moved on. So I just want to ask you one of the random uh, daily double questions that you missed. This was all the way back on the show that aired on April 11th. The question that Alex Trebek, by the way, is he just a wonderful, sweet guy? Uh, you know, I, I can't be seen off camera fraternizing with him because they have every the appearance of impropriety is a huge deal in game shows but uh you know from every interaction i've had with him he strikes me as just a consummate professional i was really admired him keeping coming into work when he knew he was dealing with this serious health yes. issue wish him the best with his uh with his health issue april 11th alex put this question out there he said this inductee into the video hall of fame <laughs> sold 17 million copies of a video cassette she released in 1982 the category by the way was celebrities and this was a oh this was a fine this was the final Jeopardy one, yeah. and then you risked three thousand ten dollars on this one. Do you remember what your answer was? Uh, yes, it was Madonna. And do you remember what the real answer it was? was? Jane Fonda. And you know, like I know it's easy <laughs> to say this now, but if I had twenty more seconds, it would have occurred to me like, oh, right. you know, cassettes can be for home workouts uh, too. How many times during the actual regular play did you just buzz without knowing the answer? And you're just I just want to get there first, or are you a guy who you only buzzed when you kind of had an inkling? I would say it wasn't a lot of times. There were uh, maybe five or so. Now, there were a couple where I, uh, I thought I knew the answer, and then I changed my mind in the middle of uh, the buzzing process, which sometimes worked out in my favor and sometimes not. Did not. All right, so sports betting. Uh, you identified yourself as a sports better on the show. And, by the way, in that regard, let me just, uh, on behalf of everybody, thank you for elevating <laughs> just what a sports better is in the public domain, right? Because most of the average person thinks of a sports better, and it's like, oh, that's some degenerate stuff right there. But here you were crushing people and uh, identifies as a sports better. And I think, I think a lot of people may have sort of been like, oh, that, well, that's interesting. Yeah, some people have tried to claim that I got it legalized in an extra couple states uh, <laughs> for right. being up there. That's your true Not legacy. Sure about that. Yeah. All right, so when did you first, like, how did you get into sports betting, first of all? Uh, so in college, I played a lot of online poker, as many, so many gamblers who live in Las Vegas now did. And, uh, you know, I kind of, so the idea of like sending money to this offshore place and, you know, trusting them to pay you back was ingrained in my head. And then 
like the idea that, hey, people can actually win doing this if they have the right strategy was also there. Um, I was also into fantasy sports. And, you know, from a young age, I really wanted to know all the statistics of the baseball players and know what they meant, you know. So I would be that kid who I would trade you for your baseball cards if I didn't have them yet and try to acquire a complete set of the uh, the players and put them all into Excel. And uh, I you can know, relate to that. Take a look at these numbers like, well, you know, what does it really mean that this guy is slugging 470 that last year, you know? Uh, but believe it or not, there was a time when 470 was a really good slugging percentage. That's right. <laughs> In a different era. Yeah, but uh, so... I, I kind of got into it first of all because you know I was already in the business of trying to figure out which players and teams were going to succeed unexpectedly next year, and I thought I might as well make a little money doing it. And you know the old like baseball prospectus sites had kind of ways to convert this information into probabilities. You know Clay Davenport used to run this Monte Carlo simulation of how often teams would make the playoffs at the end of the year. And the idea of, you know, kind of simulating randomness into the equation, like, okay, we know this team is the best team, but maybe their players get injured or maybe they, you know, bad bounces just get them along the way. You, uh, if you try to simulate the baseball season, the standard deviation of where your forecast should start and where they should end up is something like nine games. You know, that's a lot of variance into the equation. You really got to be a lot better than your competition to sweat that. So... Do you, now here's the thing, when when one says they're professional better, so my audience and the audience of Easton, very sensitive, those are the best pro bettors that I know, right? The people who are truly, uh, they devote their life to betting, they're very sensitive, right, to so when someone calls themselves a professional sports bettor. I don't know sure. if you've gotten any of this <laughs> in your sphere, right? So there are those who are like, well, does James, is he an originator of his own handicapping? Is he the one doing his own handicapping? Uh, or is he more of a guy, and by the way, no judgment from, yeah, he, yeah. from me on any of this, or is he a guy that is really about finding market inefficiencies? Is he a screen saper, uh, scraper? Is he just looking for uh, an edge numerically rather than just as an originator of a hand as a as a handicapper? Uh, yeah, you know, I don't know if you ever had Mitchell Lichtman on the show, but I remember I used to comment on some I of his. Old... I, I've not had him on the show, okay. but I'm very aware of him. Yeah, now. so I used to comment on some of his old blog posts uh, and you know introduce myself as a professional gambler, and he would be like, "Who is this guy? You know, what are his credentials?" <laughs> um, virtually. Regarding the uh, what I'm doing, I I do it all. You know, when I started out in 2006, I was just purely running my own numbers against the uh, the market, and not, you know, especially I wasn't living in Vegas then. I didn't have access to the best odds all the time, and you know, they they didn't have these apps back then, obviously. So I couldn't just drive around and expect the odds to still be there when I got there. Um, I focused largely on baseball futures at that time because I thought that was the most inefficient market, and you know, it's. I guess it's easier uh, to, if you see a line that's off, to think that, okay, no other professionals are looking at this market. Uh, I can go drive across town to the Hilton and throw down my money on this and expect it'll it'll still be there when I want it to be. And, uh, and you know, I would say, like, one, one thing I used to do every year, this is the first year I haven't done it, is, like, kind of run a baseball futures hedge fund where if I see that a team is underpriced now, I will just load up on them, you know, way more than the... Kelly Criterion says I should, knowing that I can bet against them in the World Series if they make it there. And, you know, maybe I'm giving up a, a couple percentage points on the other end, but it still, you know, works out to a long run profit that way. Uh, but I, you know, I definitely do a lot of line shopping and stuff now. You know, there are times when if I see that the the spread and money line are off in a football game, I'll bet both sides of it, that kind of thing. Or you know, if I think the market is overreact overreacting to breaking injury information, I'll, you know be happy to take a position on that, even if I don't think anything else of the game. Right, because the futures angle is, is interesting, but, you know, most would say you're not going to make a living just betting futures, right, like specifically. Well, so that's why the other stuff you're talking about is, is, is interesting to me. Are you, nowadays, are you looking more at halftime lines? Are you doing a lot of in-game stuff? Like, what? what is, how do you approach that? Yeah, so, you know, back, back in the day, I was... The market has totally changed, of course, as your listeners yeah. all well know. You know, now that you have access to these apps and you can uh, bet at the Vegas sportsbooks from home, it gives you this ability to do stuff you could never do before, like... Uh, Getting in, you don't have to physically be present at the sports book to make a halftime bet now, which is a huge deal. Or is the in-game stuff, especially. Although most most of the apps in town have limited my in-game bets to a hundred or zero dollars now, which is unfortunate. But yeah, you, oh, is that right? They have limited you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this I think I don't think there's a sports book in town that hasn't at least collared me at uh, some level. About about half of them won't take a bet from me at all, and uh, the other half they'll you know take some fraction of what they would take from a Joe 
off the street. Um, that that all started before Jeopardy, so mm. I don't think that this has necessarily affected anything. Does that apply that to far away places as well? Uh, yes, I would say. I mean, you know, like there there's some that deal with professionals and they just don't care. I mean, they'll, they they do care in the sense that they'll move the line more of an I bet than they will for someone else. Right, because there are there are shops, right? We know the two sort of pillars uh, mm -hmm. in far away places that will not ban anybody, right? Right, uh, Pinnacle or a bookmaker like that. Um, but um, that's interesting that you said that half will not take any of your bets here in Vegas and half will limit you. Yeah, that's a, about how it breaks down. So if that's the case, um, I mean, how much, you know, listen, you just came off Jeopardy, which I don't know if you know this, uh, <laughs> James, you just won $2.4 million. Like, did you, have you, because of all of those, you put all of that into the, the soup, if you will, um, has it changed your outlook on life? Like, in other words, look, I got this nest egg. Um, they're doing all these things to make my life difficult betting. Perhaps I don't do this moving forward. It has certainly occurred to me. Um, you know, there's people, without revealing too much about what's going on in my email inbox, there are people offering uh, large sums of money for, you know, chunks of my time that I might not necessarily want to give up. But it has occurred to me, like, hey, wait a minute, you know, if I... If I'm making like I don't know, let's say five thousand dollars on a typical college football Saturday, working from sun up to sundown, is that worth my time when I could go give a, a speech at some quant fund for more than that? You know, and I don't know. It's a it's a thought. Like, and then it has occurred to me maybe I shouldn't care about the money at all. You know, it's uh, like the idea. I, I I really enjoy winning. I would say that's kind of driving me more professionally right now than anything else. Is the idea like, hey, you know, I can. I can find something that's that no one else sees uh, that you know a factor that no one else has considered here and use that to to make some money. I think that's that's always been a really important reason of why I got into this line of work. And you know, if I still feel that spark, of course, I'm going to keep doing it just because. But yeah, you know, it, it the thought has occurred to me like, well, you know, maybe I spend some of my Saturday playing with my kid instead of uh, in front of Don Best screen. Might might be a might be a bit more balanced life for you at this point. Yeah, uh, you alluded to some things, some things in your email inbox. I want to get into some of your email inbox because I know you've had some chats and you have some aspirations. And if you don't mind, if we get into that, maybe a professional sports life for you. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll get with it with James Holtzauer right here exclusively on a numbers game at Veasan. It's a numbers game, live from the tip of the strip in Las Vegas. Get your fill of numbers even after the show is over by following the crew on Twitter, at Beating the Book, and at VSIN Live. What you missed. If you're looking for potentially smaller names, I, I got a pretty long list here, but some of them, maybe not the, the type that really stand out to the average better. Uh, Steven Brault of Pittsburgh, maybe very modest numbers you'll typically have to pay for him. Uh, first three years in his career, pretty ordinary numbers. Uh, his last seven starts, he's gone 35 in the third innings. Uh, his ERA is 2.04 in that span, and he's struck out 32 hitters. So he's uh, starting to come on a little bit. And uh, again, a guy you wouldn't have to pay the typically high prices for. And he goes, you know, if you would have let him curse you out, I probably could have defended you, you dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah, but Joey Crawford's got to be number one on the look at me list. All right. All right. That's good. You got Ed, 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 Ed Hockley almost made my list. Hey, I mean, it, look, yes, come on. He flexes every time. He would call something. We get it, Ed. You're bluffed. Come on. Those slow motion first down calls. Like, yeah. ah, first Oops. down. <laughs> uh, Another honorable mention, Ed Malloy in the NBA with his little two-finger technical fouls. Oh, those are good. Those are super petty, too. I like those. Hey, everybody. It's Pauly from Visa. How many of you have something that hurts, like on your body? Right now, I've got this thing with my back, an old timer, bugging the hell out of me. I heard about this stuff called Voodoo Pain Relief Cream, and I'm thinking, okay, what's this all about? Did some research, checked it out. Good, real good. Patented formula must mean something good. 11 anti-inflammatory ingredients. Sounds like a lot. Nanotechnology. No idea what that is. Must be good. Read the testimonials. Off the charts good. So I thought this might be BS, but I'll give it a shot. And what do you know? Boom, jackpot. 
What a move this was trying Voodoo Pain Relief Cream. My God, my back feels better already. Now listen to me. I know everyone has something bothering them. Joint pain, arthritis pain, muscle pain. Do you want to feel better? Then get this stuff now. Go to VoodooPainRelief.com and enter the code Pauly and you'll get a special deal. VoodooPainRelief.com. Code is Pauly. VoodooPainRelief.com. VoodooPainRelief.com. to a numbers game with your host Gil Alexander broadcasting live from our VSIN studios in Las Vegas it is a numbers game it is Gil Alexander it's Sirius XM channel 204 Jeff Parles is here or as we like to call him now Jeff Parlay maybe we'll do Parles' Parlay how have we not thought about that before Jeff we should do see, that see, a... see Vinny said it earlier yeah uh, I'll give Brendan credit and David credit back here for saying it about a month ago and then it just disappeared from my all brain right. all right no baseball pick from Jeff today by the way James Holtzauer is here from Jeopardy 32 wins in a row on Jeopardy we were just talking off air about how you know when I told some of my buddies that you were on the show the different reactions and one of which is uh, just talk about the sports but don't talk about the Jeopardy part and, and you know I'm sensitive to the fact that you have to talk about the Jeopardy part over and over and over again but to me that's still like the strategy you employed is still the most fascinating aspect of all of this right because it sh- that's the biggest window to your brain of all this I get that you have the knowledge base and all the other stuff and sports betting you do in your own private you know in your own privacy um, but that to me is what is the main point of all this? It's the fact that you came out with that, came up with that strategy, and the fact that sports betters, right, should always be looking for a different way to approach things, different markets and such. So I hope you don't mind that we rehashed all the gems. Oh no, it's no problem at all. I mean, frankly, I'm uh, a little relieved because I took like the months of April to June off work uh, to deal with everything else that was going on in my life. So I'm <laughs> I'm well behind on the baseball season. I just started doing my football research uh, this week, so. Do you, do you have any baseball futures that you like uh, right now? No, you know, I uh, I decided I would be mostly sitting out this season. I mean, they, there's a lot of factors. First of all, I got, you know, so much stuff to manage with the Jeopardy fallout. But also, you know, every year I like to take vacations during the summer. It's kind of a slow sports season. And as you know, the weather here gets intolerable after a certain point. I so. have noticed. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so I know a little bit, by the way, nothing on football yet in your research? You want to share uh, with anybody? Well, I've started. But <laughs> okay, no thoughts yet on anything? Um, you know, I mean, my thoughts are kind of the same as they always are. If you look at the the odds, I'm kind of aggregating all the odds for season wins and futures right now. And if you, you look, no surprise, you know, the worst bets tend to be on the teams that have all the hype right now. Sure. The, the Cleveland Browns, I cannot believe I'm saying this, but are the most hyped team uh, oh. now. And they're, they're probably the worst bet if you want to put out a Super Bowl future out there. I would agree. <laughs> uh, no value. That's correct. Um, all right. So I, uh, I hacked into your inbox. Um, <laughs> so Seattle Mariners, have you ever had a chat with the Seattle Mariners? Uh, there was a, a, a talk. Yes. A chat is a, a good term for it. It was all casual. You know, there's no job offer or anything, but uh, I talked with a couple of people from their front office and they, you know, I, they seem to have run, run, be running a really good organization there, you know, despite what it would seem like from their on-field performance, but they know what they're doing. You know, they, they know that, Hey, we we're in the, business of investing in assets for years from now, and they, right. they've been buying low on some players that uh, other teams have decided they don't uh, want to deal with anymore. You know, Domingo Santana, Dan Vogelbach, they, you know, players that other teams don't want, basically, and they, they're finding some value there, I think. Yeah, we've been talking about the Giants uh, recently here, who won 13 of 15 games, the San Francisco Giants, and the conundrum that they have moving to the July 31st trade deadline of, what do you do? You know, you've been selling, you've been in a sell mode all this, you know, mentally this whole way, and their GM was hired to, you know, look to the future, but the team's not cooperating with the narrative, right? They're just winning so many games that they're right in the thick of the wild card race. What do they do? And it makes baseball very unique. Do you aspire to a baseball front office job? Or if, say, James, the local franchise here in hockey, let's say the Vegas Golden Knights came calling, would that be something of interest to you? So baseball was the dream uh, definitely half a life ago when I was thinking about this sort of thing. But, you know, I will say, I mean, most people who follow baseball closely know they're they're doing all kinds of stuff they didn't do 15 years ago. And, you know, they're really playing, I would say, close to an optimal approach now of how do we find the best players? How do we pay them? Uh, how do we train them? You know, it's getting like 
so good now. Whereas I think uh, football and hockey, the two major of the four major sports, are the two that really I think could use an infusion of data and like different approaches to the problems they're facing right now. And you know, I think that. In terms of what I would enjoy the most, I'm not sure, but in terms of where I could deliver the most value to a team, it would more likely be in a different sport than baseball, I would think. Because baseball has had is, is sort of the analytics uh, began decades ago, and others other sports haven't sort of evolved necessarily as far. Yeah, and I, I understand that player tracking data is about to explode in uh, the NHL. I think there's probably a lot of stuff we can learn from that uh, mm. that is just you know breaking in. Of course, you know I I don't have access to the same data sets that these teams have, so it's I, hard I to have think noticed that. that and, and forgive me for stepping yeah, on your last one. Well, I have noticed that when baseball comes up. And more often, not more often than not, but a few times you sort of, you on your own will segue it towards hockey. I know that I did uh, right here with the Knights. <laughs> but honestly, if you, could ma- if you could wave the magic wand, though, seriously, like, and, you know, let's just say some of the Knights front office might be listening. Would that be, honestly, like something that you would absolutely embrace? Like you would want to have that meeting? Well, there's a couple of things. You know, first of all, if I work for a hockey team on site, I can not leave Las Vegas, which, uh, you know, right. aside, unless the Oakland, the Oakland slash Las Vegas Raiders call me is the only way I can really uh, do this without leaving this city, which I've come to really like. Um, you know, the, the reason the Mariners came up, my, my wife is from Seattle. She really envisions us moving back there one day. And so I kind of just tossed in an offhand comment about how this would be a place she would like me to work. And, you know, things just blow up on the Internet now for no reason. It's incredible. You've noticed. Um, yeah. You know, the, working for the Knights, I, I don't entirely know what I could do with the data they have because I don't know what it is. But, yeah. yes, that would definitely be a thing that would interest okay. me. I'm trying to get you a gig here, Jay. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, do you aspire? Now, look, you've had the Jeopardy experience. Again, $2.4 million plus in your pocket. Uh, you had the two previous experiences internationally on game shows. Do you aspire to be on any other game show? Or was Jeopardy, as you said, as a child, that was the pinnacle? Um, would another game show even let you on anymore? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I think they they have to consider their prize budget accordingly. But, you know, for the most part, these guys are looking to make a splash to get ratings. You know, I noticed Ken Jennings has been on at least like four or five other shows since he was on Jeopardy. And they, the producers are like, hey, you know, maybe he'll win a little money, but we'll we'll get the name Ken Jennings on our marquee out of it. Uh, and, you know, maybe that'll be the right thing for me down the road. I don't know. Uh, there's certainly some people who have emailed me about producing a TV show around me as uh, on-air talent. And, you know, it's mm. something I'd not necessarily considered before, but maybe we could find something that works out there. Do you enjoy the media blitz? Because, you, it, like you said, when you come back from vacation, you're expecting, not expecting, but you probably know already that there's another media blitz coming towards you. People aren't done talking to you yet, as obviously evidenced here. I, I assume they would be done by now, but it turns out they are not. <laughs> that's that's yeah. been a surprise to me, and it's, it's nice to, to be in demand, I will say that. <laughs> okay, so when we leave here, we have to in a couple minutes. Um, what bets are you making today? Are you making any bets at all? What it what is the rest of your day look like from a sports betting standpoint? Uh, so I'm still kind of in the information gathering process of uh, the NFL preseason. Um, I, I will say I would I probably would make a bet uh, at the book once I leave the studio today. Except now that they've updated their app, I haven't uh, transferred over to the new South Point app, so I can't actually check what their odds are on the uh, the futures market. And you know, if I if I had these things in my spreadsheet, I might have had a a little target sign drawn on a team or two. But I got to go kind of switch my account over and get that information first. I appreciate you coming in, James. I appreciate a couple uh, things that you shared here today that you haven't shared anywhere else. The one, the story about at the end of Jeopardy when the, <laughs> the girl giving you the money sort of gave you the hug, weeping, saying how beautifully you played that. So appreciate that nugget. Uh, and then the note that you are either banned from half or limited at half of the sports book here in, in Las Vegas. I don't think you've you've said that quite as strongly before in that way, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, you know, it's not a fact that necessarily interests most people. Oh, I think this audience <laughs> is very interested in something <laughs> right. like that. Um, I think I think that might be the big headline from this. Um, yeah, uh, I went on the Pat McAfee podcast, and he actually thought that was like the coolest thing he had ever heard, that someone could be banned from a sports book for winning. And I'm like, well, you know, when you're a professional, it's actually not that cool. <laughs> well, I mean, l- listen, what is what is your sort of, you know, because obviously there, there's many kinds of, of folks. There's that faction that is anti-sports book, no matter what, they're the, the worst thing in the world. How dare they? How dare they? Or do you, are you more of that sort of level-headed where you're like, hey, look, uh, I get it. This is how their, some of their business models are. And it's just, this is, this is how it is. And so I understand that this is their position and I'm okay with it, given that. 
No, I definitely uh, okay with it. Now, I kind of wish William Hill would come out and say publicly, hey, we, we ban players instead of waffling around it uh, every time they get interviewed about it. But, you know, <sighs> it's a business. They know what they're doing. They're, they're offering a service to a certain slice of the population. You know, I, I can still bet on sports. I just have to do it somewhere else. James, uh, your homework assignment is to uh, watch my pinned tweet on Twitter after you leave here, <laughs> uh, based on your last comment. I think that's a good thing. I think I think what you're saying is right. At least be honest about it. Yeah. Then we'd respect it more. Uh, James Holtower, everybody. $2.4 million. Appreciate you taking the time this morning. I know you have a little girl who you want to get back to. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you, Gil. James Holtzauer, greatest Jeopardy player there ever was, by my money. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks to everybody this week. Roxy, Crack, PETA, on and on. If you missed them all, and Mike, they're next right here at VEASAN. Enjoy. It's a numbers game, live from the tip of the strip in Las Vegas. Get your fill of numbers even after the show is over by following the crew on Twitter, at Beating the Book. Here's some of what you missed. Uh, if I'm just looking at who I think played it correctly, you got to love the Bulls just hanging out at seven and ending up with Kobe White, right? That, to me, is is the might be the guy. If you're looking for the surest thing in the draft, could be Kobe White. And look at that Chicago Bulls. Project me a starting lineup for the Bulls. How good is this team? Young also. Kobe White, Zach Levine, Wendell Carter, who, by the way, got hurt last year, but was great in summer league last year. Laurie Markkinen, Otto Porter over from the Wizards. I like that little squad. I like Johnny to make a prop bet this year for the Giants. Over under 15 and a half interceptions for Eli Manning. 